I'm Brian Green. I'm with Zeno AN Solutions. We're a boutique consulting firm. We work with uh, pr approximately 300 institutional asset owners, with 60% of those being public funds, like yourselves. Um, I'm joined, happy to introduce actually the CEO of Owl Analytics, Ben Webster. And uh, what we were planning to do today was more of a kind of a fireside chat. A couple uh, disclosures. One, I am in no way an expert on ESG matters, but uh, I was tasked with uh, by my firm to look into the e ESG space because we assist clients in looking at their tra trading, their trading costs, what the impact is to performance in the public market space. And so we get data from probably eight to 12 different you know, market data vendors. We take that raw data, we make it digestible for pension funds like yourselves to do due diligence on your managers. Uh, very much the service that Martin Cabrera and, and Gil Garcia were talking about, if you were in the session uh, on Monday when they talked about, hey, we need to kind of put pressure on our managers to make sure they're trading with the right folks. What brokers are they using? Are they getting value from that? That's what we do, we evaluate that. And so I was very pleased when uh, Dale uh, Nybert, who I met at HEB years ago, uh, said, hey, Brian, do you want to interview you know, uh, Ben? And I said, happy to, because they're one of our newest market data vendors. Um, so when I look at ESG, I'm looking at it from my client's perspective of the public market space. We, you know, we're doing this TCA. We're looking at equities, bonds, FX futures, and helping you digest that. And so uh, what I thought maybe is Ben could give a little background on, you know, where he comes from, what OWL does, and, you know, who they service, and then we'll get into some of the questions that I kind of pull clients before coming here to say, what would you want to know about this from a pension perspective? So maybe give a little background and then we'll jump uh, in. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. And everybody, thank you so much for having me and uh, listening to what we both have here to say. Um, so as Brian mentioned, my name is Ben Webster. I'm the CEO of Al ESG and, and the founder, one of the founders. Uh, we've been around for almost a decade, and we work with institutional investors around the world. We have some asset owner clients as well, large financial technology clients. Um, you know, what we really do is we're just an ESG data com and analytics company. It's as simple as that. Um, we gather uh, ESG-related data, environmental, social, and governance data about, most, for the most part, public companies, um, how they're treating the environment, um, kind of, you know, what are, the, what are their positive and negative effects on the environment, how they're treating their stakeholders, with, wh whether that's their, their employees, their customers, their investors, vendors, or what have you, um, and the communities they, live, they, they w live and work in, and last but not least, how well they govern themselves ethically. Um, so that's really what we do as a company. Our, I want to make this very clear, our job is not to tell people um, what to invest in and what not to invest in, um, what to believe or not to believe from a values or ethical perspective. We merely provide the data to let uh, others, let people themselves express what they care about and what their values are, um, and, and whether, that be, um, whether that be they want to not invest in certain things and invest in others, or, and, and we have no judgment on, on what that may be. Great, uh, and maybe I think might, what might be helpful uh, is if we could get into, you know, at a high level, just describe what ESG is, like historically, where, you know, where does it come from, what does it stem from, yep. and then if today, you know, what would an asset owner, what should they be concerned with, and in your viewpoint, why should asset owners be concerned with ESG at this stage of the game? Um, great question. So, you know, I may be covering some ground that some people know, but I'll try to, uh, um, you know, kind of uh, summarize it pretty quickly. I mean, ESG is not new. It's been around for hundreds of years. Um, it's most commonly known in the form of socially responsible investing. You know, the, you know, the Quakers weren't the first to do it, but they're one of the earliest well-known investors to do it. In fact, also look, uh, the Dutch East Indies Company uh, also um, um, uh, at one time employed approaches of, of, of you know, a socially responsible nature to where they were allocating their capital. Um, long story short, it, it's been around for a long time. Um, and it's kind of been a fringe part of the investment world uh, for, for pretty much all of that time, right until the early 2000s. 
And in the early 2000s, it kind of got rebranded. It, you know, it did get rebranded as ESG. And there, there's a, they, they mean slightly different things, social responsible investing and, e, and ESG. But ESG, is what the difference is, is and why ESG took off is precisely this. There was a lot of research that came out on, you know, and there's hundreds of research papers that was really, were really not necessarily focused on stock returns, but they were, it was focused on um, how ESG issues had operational effects um, on how companies uh, perform from a fundamental perspective, like earnings growth, sales growth, cost of capital, what have you. People realized that some of these issues are material. Not all ESG issues are material to all types of companies, but there are uh, uh, ESG issues that if, if companies uh, do monitor them and try to improve on them, it can actually become companies that will survive longer and hopefully grow faster and, and outperform their peers. So ESG was, I, 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 I'll use the word compromise. Um, a compromise kind of implies that you're s settling on something that's worse. Uh, than optimal, but I, I disagree strongly on that. I, I think in this case, the compromise was amazing. What, what ESG really is, is the intersection of social responsibility and materiality. And that's why the, the financial industry embraced it as fast as they embraced it and why it grew as fast as it grew. Now, um, how do I say it? Um, of course, with the rise in popularity of ESG, there will pe be people who want to force their, their way of looking at things on others, and we're seeing that happening. Um, I, and I'm someone who actually strongly disagrees with people who want to tell other people how to think. Um, so, but that is happening, and there's that, I, I do worry about that. But for the most part, um, I'm a big fan of ESG, because uh, over time, more and more research will be being poured into you know, ESG issues and, and how they can uh, help companies manage risk and outperform their peers, and hopefully, over time, c those certain industries will realize that, oh, if I focus and invest in issues that are materially relevant to my, to my company and my industry, I can both help the planet and actually grow faster more and with better earnings. And that, that's what, what, to me, ESG is and represents. Um, um, as far as asset owners, you know, there's, uh, you know, to kind of summarize what we're trying to get to eventually here is what, how should asset owners look at this? Asset owners should be looking at material issues that affect their portfolio. And I know it's not, it's not as simple as that because there are a lot of disagreement on what's material and not for different industries, and we'll get to that later. But, the, but it, they need to focus on as much as they can on making sure that they are reducing the material risks in their portfolio. And the second thing, is um, you may have stakeholders that care about certain things. And that could be, uh, how do I say it, a ticking time bomb if you don't get ahead of it and be proactive in, in developing your ESG narrative. Not the ESG narrative that the world may want, the ESG narrative that you can get behind and you, th you think your stakeholders will be happy that you're proactive about. And, and I'll kind of leave it at that for now. Let's think about this from, you know, the trustees are sitting here in the room from an operational perspective. Say, you know what, that, I get that. I, I want to, I have certain things, maybe social is more important or governance is more important to me and there are aspects of that. From an operational perspective, you know, just sitting in the public market space like we do, all of, you know, you, there's very defined roles uh, from the various vendors where an asset owner can go in and say, listen, I, I want to go invest in public equities, right? Uh, I have a general consultant. They're going to determine an asset allocation. They're going to go out to managers, find the manager. We'll hire them based on their recommendation. The custodian bank settles their trades. We get a report each quarter. We know what our performance is. When I look at this slide that you had in your, uh, not this one, where is it? Get past me and Ben. <laughs> There's a slide in here that I was looking at, and I'm going to have to go backwards here. It's probably at the end, of course. This right here. <laughs> this slide right Sorry. here, like, like I know the defined roles of, you know, to get an equity portfolio up and running and, and, to, and to do my due diligence if I'm a trustee. When I look at the ESG space here, I'm like, this landscape is huge. There's so many 
you know, moving parts in it, and some are doing similar things, some are doing different things. Can you, yep. can you shed some light on, one, who are the players in this space that yeah. if I want to do this kind of due diligence, who should I be talking to if I'm a pension fund? Um, well, uh, great slide. If, if you, if you um, were thinking about doing something with ESG, this, is, this slide will scare you off from it. <laughs> um, so there are a lot of vendors out there. And there are a lot of different niche players um, and different types of ESG data. So I'll break down ESG data into three major categories that are, uh, maybe I'll break it down into four major categories uh, that are, you know, how do I say it, very popular and common. Um, one is ratings, ESG ratings. Think of it like S&P, bond ratings, Moody's ratings, Fitch ratings for bonds, right? Um, um, there are ESG ratings that are trying to say how well is this company managing their risks, and supposedly material risks, um, that are relevant to their industry and to, to, to them specifically, right? That's what the ESG ratings are trying to accomplish. Um, now, they don't necessarily do that well, but they try to. Um, then there is what is traditionally the SRI tool, uh, um, uh, which is ethic, what they call ethical screens. I don't want to invest in companies that, are, uh, you know, that sell adult entertainment products. I don't want to invest in companies that are, um, that are making uh, weapons of mass destruction or, or things like cluster munitions or landmines. I don't want to invest in companies that are, um, um, that are like in, in, in the tobacco industry, for example. You know, there are, you know, that's not me specifically, those are examples of what, what I call ethical screens, a way to avoid vesting in and take out, com identify companies that are in lines of business that you don't believe in ethically and get them out of your portfolio. So that's the second one. Third one is what I call controversies. Is a company involved in a child labor controversy, a human rights controversy, an environmental, current environmental catastrophe of some kind, like a major oil spill? Um, th that, that, that's, that's a third one. We, we, people like to avoid companies that are involved in, in scandals, right? Um, that, that, uh, that they don't believe in ethically or uh, that could really hurt the company. Like for example, Chipotle and the, um, and the food poisoning uh, uh, issue that happened multiple times it could be, have a very material effect on the company's performance, not, as, not, only, not to mention that it could hurt people, right? Um, and last but not least, I'm in Texas, but it's, it, I have to mention carbon emissions, you know, and uh, related to, to that type of data, that has become extremely popular. Um, so those are like the four main types. And all those vendors on there are doing something or other related to those four things. Um, and, and the problem is, is where do you start? And you know, like you know, we said, we have the acronym KISS up there, keep it simple, stupid. It really is important. You just need to keep it simple. Don't overthink what you do or what vendor you go with. Um, what you want to do is just get a really simple snapshot of, your, of the managers in your, that you've invested in and how your overall book is looking. And, and obviously, I think there are better vendors to choose, but don't lose yourself in all of that on that slide. Focus on the high goal. What do you want to achieve from, from the perspective of ESG, assuming if you, you do want to achieve something, and put in a, put in a, 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 either a technology or a data overlay to actually monitor what you want to achieve. And it's, it's much easier than you think it is. Uh, that, that, that it's much easier than, than you know. Um, so don't get too scared by that. So this slide is just scary and to ignore it all. <laughs> yeah, that, that's my point. But, there, you, but, you, you can, you, there's one vendor in there that I, I don't think you should ignore, but other than that, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, I mean, I mean so, and, and you kind of brought up the elephant in the room, and so allow me a, a, little, uh, a, a little background with this next question. Um, when we look at the media today, we're seeing a lot of chatter, a lot of noise about ESG. It's a polarizing topic and on both sides of the fence in, in many ways. Uh, two, just two weeks ago, you know, everybody in this room probably is aware, the, the controller uh, for the state of Texas is interviewing and, and sent out uh, uh, questionnaires of 19 uh, investment managers domiciled in the state 
that said they are going to ban fossil fuels from their portfolios. Uh, and, and, and to his credit, he's looking at it saying, listen, that's a detriment to our economy here. And I have a bill that's going to block that from happening, but I want to see the answers first because I got a list of 100 other institutional investors behind that that I will submit additional questionnaires to. On the other side, if you look in Washington right now through the Department of Labor, the, the current administration is saying we'd like to have a disclosure about carbon emissions implemented in any ERISA funds uh, investment guidelines. Two days ago, the SEC came out and said the two areas that they are most focused on providing uh, requirements uh, or regulatory requirements on are ESG and um, uh, Bitcoin and, 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 and cryptocurrencies. Now, the area that they're looking at from the ESG perspective is looking at investment advisors, so your managers, as well as the brokers they're utilizing, because if you look at a lot of the funds you see, the ETFs, the, the portfolios, you see sustainability in the name. Uh, Gil Garcia talked about green bond funds on Monday with, uh, with Martin, and it was like, okay, you put those, you're putting those names out there that you're suggesting that you're making attestations of we're, we're ESG friendly or we, we're meeting requirements. They are, want to start regulating that. So when I have conversations with our clients and we're talking, you know, about the results of their trading in those public market spaces, we get into a lot of minutia and they'll start talking to us and say, you know, we see a lot of this going on. You know, when we look at our client base, probably the large state funds that have a lot of resources, you know, they have in investment, you know, 10, 15 investment officers. They're taking a look at this a little bit, but for the majority of most US pension funds that we see today, they might have a couple of questions that they ask, you know, qualitative if, to their managers about ESG. What they often come to us and say during those conversations is that, yeah, you know, the, the thing that we're concerned about is if we put that umbrella of ESG above our managers in their portfolio, are we limiting what they can invest in and therefore dot, 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 are we stepping outside of our fiduciary obligation to grow the assets of the fund? When you hear that, what, you know, that viewpoint, what do you, what do you say to that viewpoint? Um, there's a lot to unpack there. So let, let me start by saying um, ESG is subjective, right? Uh, you know, just as your own viewpoints about maybe faith or, or, or family or ethics are subjective, ESG is a very subjective topic. Now, I, 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 want, I want to be very transparent. ESG issues affect the world. You know, uh, just like if you jump off a cliff, you're going to fall, the law of gravity is there, right? Too much carbon emissions, you know, I, I, you know I'm not an, an environmental scientist, but I think a lot of scientists agree that we do want to lower our carbon emissions, right? But the fact of the matter is, is that fossil fuel companies aren't evil. They're necessary. Uh, Elon Musk had a quote recently, uh, maybe a year ago, about, hey, you know, if we get rid of fossil fuel, society would collapse at right, right now. We're not ready for, for, for that. Fossil fuels pl companies, energy companies play a valuable role in making the world work. And, and ultimately make sure people have heat in their homes and food on their tables, uh, right? and have homes, right? So it's about, it's really about, to, in my mind, disclosure. If you're going to, I, I, I think fossil fuel companies should not be been a lot, but, and I'm gonna relate this to what you do, you know, investing in secular. Fossil fuel companies shouldn't be villainized, they are. At the same time, alternative technologies like solar and all that shouldn't be turned into angels either. Right, and I think I think the problem is is that the society as a whole wants to create things into this black and white, but solar uh, energy companies, wind companies, wind wind turbine companies, you know, there there's fossil fuels that are used in the creation of those technologies, and they should be disclosing their fossil fuel um, use and emissions, right? So it has to be transparent all around, right, and and. And ultimately, that's, I, want, I just want to put that on the table. Now, how, how does that relate to what you need to do as, 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 an, as a, you know, running a public pension or, or running, running money um, and your fiduciary duty to grow those assets and, and, and a, and a, you know, you know, in a risk-adjusted manner that makes sense for your stakeholders, right? 
again, I think you should use ESG from the perspective of as a way of managing risk, right? The goal of ESG scores and ratings is to try to let you know which companies are attempting to manage those risks, right? Um, the problem you have, though, um, is that, how do I say it, is that ESG ratings are divergent, right? So the major vendors out there in the market are MSCI, Sustainalix, which is owned by Morningstar. Um, there's Rubico Sam, which is uh, owned by S&P Global. Um, and there's a, a, there's a sundry of others. Um, the problem is, is that their, their, their ESG ratings diverge. Tesla could look like it it have, could be a really good E rating with MSCI, but it could be a poor E rating with another, um, another ESG rating provider. Um, and for various reasons I won't go into, um, but they have different ways of looking at what actual uh, environmental impacts of Tesla, um, they have a different way of looking and going which environmental impacts are important and which are not important, right, to the material outperformance of Tesla. And that, unfortunately, you don't have the time to sift through is Sustainalix right or is MSCI right or is S&P right. Um, um, Al, Al actually has a solution. I won't, I'll just quickly say we're like the consensus scores of ESG ratings. We're the consensus ESG rating company. We aggregate data and ratings from hundreds of sources, including 14 plus of the major ESG ratings vendors, and we score based on the consensus view of that group. So kind of like the IBIS, <coughs> excuse me, consensus estimates for earnings. We're kind of the consensus ESG ratings company, right? And I'm not saying you have to use this, but I'm saying that's a solution for that subjectivity. And we also have other data like um, if your stakeholders or you as managers of your funds have determined that we think certain types of ethical activity, uh, business lines of uh, we, we don't want to be involved in, maybe, you know, GMOs, who knows? I, I'm not saying that's bad or good, but maybe that's not something you want to do. We also have, you know, us and other vendors have data that can help you craft your portfolio to focus on materiality as well as ethical issues if you want to. Focus, if you, excuse me, if you want to focus on those ethical issues. So uh, that's, that's what you need to focus on. Materiality and if there's any ethical issues that you, you and your stakeholders want, uh, stakeholders want to execute, just focus on those. Don't focus on anything else the rest of the world is telling you to do, right? And, uh, and it's as simple as that. So, so just to kind of tie that in, I think with a, a pension fund sitting in here and saying, you know what, uh, I didn't know what to do before. There's clearly ratings that I can utilize and I can basically customize what's important to my fund and our obligations to the fund. So it could be focused on environmental, but it could be social or governance. And, you know, in other words, and, and I think I had read something, you know, about the use of fossil fuels, that even like the batteries that are used in smart, you know, smart vehicles, like the lithium in those are highly toxic to the environment. The environment, yet, correct. Yet we're going to ban the, the fossil fuels that are, you know, enacting that to happen. You know, you can't create the clean energy with just clean energy because it's just not there yet. Yeah. So, in other words, you can kind of get ahead of this, ahead of maybe regulators, government, whatever they might be dictating, saying this is what we want you to do going forward, and you can create your own protocols within whatever's important to you based exactly. on those ratings. Exactly. Well, I'm really fa fast. Go, go back to some of the slides that show the growth of ESG. Um, go show like the, 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 the curves, right? So here, like, here's an example, like, just you know, the growth of sustainable funds. Um, um, and there's a couple more slides. We don't have to really go through them in detail, right? But what's important for you to know, ESG is huge. It, uh, trillions of dollars is, uh, is being invested using ESG data and ratings and what have you. Whether you want to pay attention to it or not, it's paying attention to you. If MSCI or, or, or the major rating vendors upgrade or downgrade a company, take, an, it, take a company in and out of an index because of ESG, that will affect you. If the market is, if, is, if the, and if the market is pumping up ESG stocks, that will affect you or, or penalizing non-ESG stocks, what they view as ESG. So you need to be on top of that. 
in some way or form. It is material to you. The question is, how do you do it, and how do you do it efficiently? And that's, that, and, and it, it may seem overwhelming based on that earlier slide, but it's not. Um, what you can't do, and which I don't think you want to be doing, is you don't want to be poring over spreadsheets, over Excel, Excel tables, and what have you. What you need is a tool, a monitoring tool that maps ESG data and ESG metrics to your portfolio where you can set up a compliance um, regime, per se, or methodology that fits what you want to do like a glove and use that tool to monitor how your managers are doing according to what you want them to do, kind of like a trade cost analysis, for example, right? Um, to, if a manager, if you go, you know what, how, how do you institute ESG? You could institute it by looking at your portfolio as a whole, or you can look at ESG by, you know what, I'm gonna, you know, I, I, do, I do believe that maybe certain ESG managers may outperform their peers. You could talk to potential ESG managers and go, hey, how are you managing your ESG risks? Well, that's great, but how do you know they're actually doing what they say they're doing? Well, that, a, a, there could be a cool monitoring tool that does that for you and takes all the heavy lifting out of it. You set it up, you, you, you manage it, there's alerts, and you essentially, um, essentially makes it easy sailing. You know, it just got to set it up and, and go. And so I think there are, I don't think you should be going out and licensing ESG data and, and having teams and analysts doing it all yourself. What you need to do is you need to approach this, at what you want to accomplish from the top down, and then try to find a tool to help you do it and do it well, and do it efficiently and cost effectively. And, and don't let anyone tell you to do it in any way you don't want to do it. Do it the way you want to do it. And, and that's, that's my advice. Great. You know, I mean, th that's, like I said at the beginning of this full disclosure, OWL became our most recent data, uh, market data vendor. Um, we, we get stuff from market, IHS Market, Market Access, Bloomberg, Morningstar, all these different firms. But we have been looking at this from our client's perspective, all the conversations we have with public pension funds. Um, we're, we're reviewing their trading uh, in the public sector, and I think that taking that data and providing a tool like that, a top-down approach saying, hey, I've got 10 minutes to look at uh, e my manager's ESG scores each quarter will help in creating a due diligence protocol. Um, and, you know, and, and, I, and I think that that's where asset owners should be coming is, you know, we, we've got due diligence on our managers. We do it for equities, we do it for bonds, private equity, hedge funds. If we're going to implement ESG, we want something that's very simple, to the point, and it helps us to check that box as a fiduciary and say, hey, not only do we meet our obligations, but we have protocols in place that are important to our, you know, our emotions, our feelings, our way of running things. So, you know, whether it's protection of fossil fuels because it's important to the economy, or if it's, listen, we want diversity and inclusion as a major focus in our investment guidelines. Those are all things that you can focus in and ignore the noise on the other parts. Yeah, it, you know, it's again, it's, it's part risk management and the, and the risk management portion is extremely important. And, you know, I'm not, and I'm not telling you not to approach things with an ethical uh, lens. I, I applaud people who do so, but make sure it's your ethical lens and that of your stakeholders and set it up and, and manage it effectively and efficiently. Uh, I, questions? Uh, great, great question. So, um, so greenwashing, what is greenwashing? Greenwashing is when a, a company, so uh, let's take a step back. Companies publish, just like they publish annual reports, right? And 10Ks and 10Qs, they are starting to publish what are called annually uh, sustainability reports or CSR reports, corporate social responsibility reports, you know, ESG reports, impact reports. It goes under many names. I, I, I think of them, uh, the most common name is sustainability report. Um, in those reports, they disclose what their track record and progress and goals and across a variety of ESG issues. So where greenwashing comes in 
is, is you know, I, I want to take the politics out of it. But I will say, from, for the most part, greenwashing is the idea that, twofold idea, that companies are giving it a lot of lip service in those rep reports and not taking action. Um, I've read those reports. I've read hundreds of them. A lot of them are taking action. They really are. However, I do think there's a viewpoint that because, you know, there's a, there's a political tide in the United States that corporations and companies are bad and profit is bad. So I think a lot of people have this expectation that it is lip service. And to be blunt, in some cases it is, in some cases it isn't. And the, the, there is a, a market demand for, just like you have auditors of your financial statements, uh, auditors of your sustainability reports. And that is, you know, that's starting to happen. There are companies that are focused on, on auditing those things. And I, I think that's a good thing. You shouldn't be lying, right, in your sustainability report. So th that's what greenwashing is. It's a problem that exists. I don't think companies, all companies are greenwashing. And, uh, I, I think companies are really actually are trying to do a good job for the most part. Um, but it's, it's, it's hard to verify in any case what they say. And I also say, be very clear, sometimes the data is just not there, right? Um, you know, if, you know let, and I, carbon emissions may be a loaded topic, but they, they want companies to go, okay, let's say I build cars, right? There's a thing called scope three carbon emissions. That's like, if you put your products into the marketplace, what are the carbon emissions of your product in the marketplace when they're used by others, right? That's a hard thing for a car manufacturer to estimate. They don't know how many miles the people who are using, driving those cars are driving. So the, uh, part of it is, of the greenwashing component is unrealistic expectations of what a company can monitor. And so I don't want you to worry about all those things. That's what I worry about. I worry about it by trying to translate that. And that's why I try to, I try to do the approach of, of the wisdom of the crowd. Because of, over time, I think the individual research companies are going to get better and better and more objective and more objective, hopefully. And if there are people, groups that aren't objective, we can see that by comparing them to others, right? And synthesizing that into what we call the consensus ratings. But um, to answer your question, it exists. Um, I think people are trying to solve it, but I don't think it's as bad and as, as, as crazy alarming as, as the alarmists will may make it Obscene. So I, 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 that is happening. Sorry, excuse me. It's 100% already taking hold, and that's what I'm saying is ESG. It's it is material. Let's just say, let's just pretend that all this in climate change is bunk. I don't think it is, but let's just say it is bunk. People believe it's real it'll affect stock prices, right? Now, what I'm asking for is just a fair and balanced approach, right? So there is a huge generational millennial and younger desire to work with, invest in, and, um, and uh, be a, you know, a buyer or purchaser of goods and services that are perceived to be environmentally friendly or positively impactful, right? Um, um, uh, that's great. Those same, those same consumer blocks or investor blocks are completely ignoring the negative effects of supposed green technology. Because there's a lot of green technologies that have vastly, very bad environmental negative effects. But it's not talked about. Like wind turbines kill, kills, you know, 
po populations and n species of birds, right? Um, so that's an example. So I, I just want people to be objective, fair, and balanced. But again, it's not my goal for people to list to focus on what I believe. I want ESG should be a a a, a means of 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 people voting what they believe and enacting what they believe. And as pensions, you need to make your stance on what you believe is materially relevant to your long-term uh, goal of growing the capital and achieving your fiduciary duty. And you, if there's anything ethical that you want to trade off, like, for example, if you want to get rid of tobacco, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to be kick, uh, picking on tobacco companies, if you say, no, we just don't want to invest in tobacco, uh, knowing that maybe there may be a cycle in the market where tobacco outperforms and you're going to give up that that performance, that's that's up to you and your stakeholders. But I, you know, that's not our job. I should I personally don't think it should. Personally, also, I don't think it should be the SEC's job or any regulator's job to tell people that. Anyway, I so don't think it looks like there's a question out there. You're saying they should be awarded additional capital? Got it, got it. Well, you know, again, I would say that's kind of any, any one individual's right to invest that way if they want, and if others don't want to invest in a European manager and choose to invest in other managers for other reasons, that's, that's their choice. I, I think another aspect of this that m might not be looked at as well is that this idea of comparing um, you know, say fossil fuel companies to the broad market isn't necessarily, you know, an appropriate thing to do. You might want to look at them within their sector or their subsector and say, well, what are these companies doing to improve the environment? Because there are, you know, Exxon and Mobil and, and you know, Chevron, uh, Total, they're all going out there. They're trying, they're realizing this is coming at them. And they're saying, we are putting efforts in place to make ourselves look better. So sometimes the, the right thing to do is, is not to necessarily take the alpha out of the portfolio by banning them, but it's to measure each of those companies against their peers and say, who's doing a good job in trying to make this better? And so, yes, there are gonna be investors who say absolutely not, to your point. Uh, but from the US's perspective, I think it's a slow roll versus Europe, and that it's kind of like starting blocks right now. There is a war in ESG going on, and the war is, um, I, my mind's blanking on the word, but uh, do you just completely um, exit out of, of certain types of companies and, and completely just say, no, well, I'm not investing in them, or do you invest in them and have a vote and try to promote change from within, right? And so there are some fossil fuel companies that are among the largest uh, 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 generators of clean, clean energy revenue, right? So one side of the debate is no, Let's, let's not invest in them. The other side of the debate is, is hey, if we can uh, help institute change within these companies um, and help them see that they can transition to other forms of, of, of uh, green energy revenue, they, that's actually better for the sustainability of their company in the long run, as well as for the world. So I want to have a seat at that table, right? Again, I, I, I personally don't have a horse in this race. I think both approaches are valid. To, you know, and it really just depends on what you and your stakeholders want to do. It's simple as that. 